Chapter 6 An Apology for the Insensibility of Mr. Jones to All the Charms of the Lovely Sophia, in which possibly we may in a considerable degree lower his character in the estimation of those men of wit and gallantry who approve the heroes in most of our modern comedies. There are two sorts of people who, I am afraid, have already conceived some contempt for my hero on account of his behaviour to Sophia. The former of these will blame his prudence in neglecting an opportunity to possess himself of Mr. Weston's fortune, and the latter will no less despise him for his backwardness to so fine a girl who seemed ready to fly into his arms if he would open them to receive her. Now, though I shall not, perhaps, be able absolutely to acquit him of either of these charges, for want of prudence admits of no excuse, and what I shall produce against the latter charge will, I apprehend, be scarce satisfactory, yet, as evidence may sometimes be offered in mitigation, I shall set forth the plain matter of fact, and leave the whole to the reader's determination." Mr. Jones had somewhat about him, which, though I think writers are not thoroughly agreed in its name, doth certainly inhabit some human breasts, whose use is not so properly to distinguish right from wrong as to prompt and incite them to the former, and to restrain and withhold them from the latter. This somewhat may be indeed resembled to the famous trunk-maker in the playhouse, for whenever the person who is possessed of it doth what is right, no ravished or friendly spectator is so eager or so loud in his applause. On the contrary, when he doth wrong, no critic is so apt to hiss and explode him. To give a higher idea of the principle I mean, as well as one more familiar to the present age, it may be considered as sitting on its throne in the mind, like the Lord High Chancellor of this kingdom in his court, where it presides, governs, directs, judges, acquits, and condemns according to merit and justice, with a knowledge which nothing escapes, a penetration which nothing can deceive, and an integrity which nothing can corrupt. This active principle may perhaps be said to constitute the most essential barrier between us and our neighbours the brutes, for if there be some in the human shape who are not under any such dominion, I choose rather to consider them as deserters from us to our neighbours, among whom they will have the fate of deserters and not be placed in the first rank. Our hero, whether he derived it from Thwackham or Square, I will not determine, was very strongly under the guidance of this principle. For though he did not always act rightly, yet he never did otherwise without feeling and suffering for it. It was this which taught him, that to repay the civilities and little friendships of hospitality by robbing the house where you have received them is to be the basest and meanest of thieves." He did not think the baseness of this offence lessened by the height of the injury committed. On the contrary, if to steal another's plate deserved death and infamy, it seemed to him difficult to assign a punishment adequate to the robbing a man of his whole fortune and of his child into the bargain. This principle, therefore, prevented him from any thought of making his fortune by such means, for this, as I have said, is an active principle, and doth not content itself with knowledge or belief only. Had he been greatly enamoured of Sophia, he possibly might have thought otherwise, but give me leave to say that there is great difference between running away with a man's daughter from the motive of love, and doing the same thing from the motive of theft. Now, though this young gentleman was not insensible of the charms of Sophia, though he greatly liked her beauty and esteemed all her other qualifications, she had made, however, no deep impression on his heart. For which, as it renders him liable to the charge of stupidity, or at least of want of taste, we shall now proceed to account. The truth, then, is his heart was in the possession of another woman. 
Here, I question not but the reader will be surprised at our long taciturnity as to this matter, and quite at a loss to divine who this woman was, since we have hitherto not dropped a hint of any one likely to be a rival to Sophia. For as to Mrs. Bliffill, though we have been obliged to mention some suspicions of her affection for Tom, we have not hitherto given the least latitude for imagining that he had any for her. And indeed I am sorry to say it, but the youth of both sexes are too apt to be deficient in their gratitude for that regard with which persons more advanced in years are sometimes so kind to honour them.' 